I think it's always interesting when we do these things to, to understand the presenter's point of view and where they're coming from. So, David, if you have a, a couple of minutes, could you just give us a, a quick background on Mirabout as an organization and what they think their unique offering is? And then your role in the organization and, and kind of your background in the industry to kind of give us a frame for uh, how you approach DSG and where you're coming from from a knowledge base. Yeah, sure. So, uh, hello, everyone. My name is David Brooks, and uh, basically I work at Mirabo Asset Management. Uh, we've got 12 different investment teams uh, covering different asset classes and uh, looking at different parts of the market. Um, obviously, today we are talking about ESG. And one of the things I did want to, to point out is actually for Mirabo Asset Management, this is actually one of the, uh, the, the fundamental parts of the way that actually all of the uh, investment teams choose investments and how, how they actually uh, select the, uh, the different companies. So at the moment, we are currently managing just under 7 billion Swiss francs. And we've been around for 200 years as a private bank, but the asset management has been around for roughly about 10 years. So it's a fundamental part of us. Um, so I suppose that gives you a brief overview or understanding of uh, Mirabeau Asset Management. In terms of myself, uh, I'm actually a project manager. I've been at Mirabeau for the last seven years. Uh, before that, I've actually uh, spent seven years working at Bloomberg, where I dealt with much uh, different data parts of the order management system and so forth. Since arriving in uh, Mirabeau, I've done multiple different projects from helping replace the, uh, the order management system to uh, working on the data management side, helped implement uh, market EDM as the, uh, the backbone to, to a lot of the, the data management area. Uh, we've also done uh, projects in uh, revamping the CRM and, and various other things. So I suppose it might sound strange, but I'm a bit of a jack of all trades and, and uh, knowledge of nothing, <laughs> as they say. But uh, ultimately, uh, when there's a project that comes along or if there's a optimization or new regulations that come to come to fruition, then uh, I actually often get summoned by the, uh, the COO or CEO, uh, depending on what's going on at the time, and get involved. So, uh, so pretty much I, I report directly to the COO and uh, the strategic business uh, parts that, that need help and actually extra support and management, that's where I come in. Wow, terrific. Okay. You know, I, I, I liked your comment about, you know, the jack of all trades. And I would say, you know, the, 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 you know, the, knowledge, the, the, the knowledge component is that project experience. So I'm wondering now with that kind of frame or lens, can you take us back to your ESG Go Live? Because obviously you were coming in to a new market segment, a new vertical, and really helping the team build that out. So I, I'm guessing that when you were brought into the project prior to the go live, uh, there was there was a set of user requirements. There were data, probably a universe of data sets and scope. You know, how did you kind of manage that as an outsider? And then, you know, what were the key challenges your business users presented that they wanted to address? And and how did you prioritize them? Because I think that your role as a project role is something very common in asset management organizations. They they generally bring on someone like yourself to deal with change. And I'm sure there's people on this call who would want to know as an outsider, how do you kind of wrangle that kind of project component? So I, I actually think this will be really great for a lot of participants. Yes, that's quite actually quite a big question you've asked me there. But that's I, fine. I, I tend to be a little wordy. <laughs> I apologize. That's Okay. So um, I suppose what's, what's interesting, as I said at the beginning, uh, Mirror Asset Management, ESG has been fundamental to, uh, to the structure. And actually, most of the investment teams have always had some form of that in their, their scope and their setup, because ultimately, when they are selecting a company to invest in, they are looking for the best in breed. So they do uh, speak with the, uh, the companies. They do look to engage with management and find out what their next strategy is and so on to see if it's a viable and sustain, sustainable uh, projects and so on going forward. Uh, so that's how they decide whether they're going to invest. And this has always been around. But I suppose what has happened in the last five years is there is an explosion, really, of information and data in the last five years, particularly on the uh, key topic, which is ESG, environmental, social and governance uh, elements. So that's been a, a huge push in the market in general. And actually, Mirabeau has been, been looking at this. And we could have uh, greenwashed as such all of our funds and slapped on the logo and so on, but management realized that that would be wrong. So what they've done is they've actually looked at the different funds that we have in place. And we already had uh, three funds which were ESG enabled and they were the whole process was, was in place. And we did have uh, data coming in from different sources, but it was very, very simple and quite basic, really. 
What happened is in 2018, the ESG team uh, that we have at Mirabeau actually expanded. We had a new head that arrived, Sir Hamid Amour, uh, arrived in Paris, and he took on the role of actually uh, uh, reshaping the way that we saw ESG. Uh, at the same time as he, he brought this in, he actually started to bring in what we call the four pillars um, for, for ourselves. So the first pillar is actually exclusion. What this means is actually we exclude securities which are not uh, valid, so whether they might be tobacco or weapons and so on. So those companies are not allowed to be invested in. The second part is actually ownership. So it's engagement with the, uh, the companies themselves. It's making sure that actually uh, we are trying to find out what their business plans are, how actually we can uh, evolve that and make sure it's a, a viable uh, investment that we're going to make. Uh, the third part, which is the ESG integration, and that is all about actually getting the right data in front of the investment teams and analysts, the portfolio managers, to make sure that that makes sense. And so that's the that's a key part, and that's obviously part of the case study that I'll talk about shortly. Um, the uh, fourth part of the uh, the four pillars is actually the climate change. And this is actually a key one for, I think, everyone, to be honest. Um, and I think if, even if you don't believe in climate change, uh, you've just got to look at the way that COVID-19 has reacted with everyone. As I mean, we've seen in Venice, for example, the, the blue waters arrived, people send dolphins there and various other things. And you can even see it by the less planes around, uh, there's less noise pollution. So I think generally, even if you don't believe in climate change, you can clearly see the benefits of actually what has happened in the last six months even if we may not be too happy with COVID and so on, but it's, it's clearly a, a, a positive sign for the climate and I think for the, for the planet as well. So that's actually the four pillars uh, that we, we have. So bearing that in mind, that was back in the uh, end of 2018, 2019. And 2019, um, we were really uh, looking at actually the different, uh, basically data that we had in place with the ESG team, with Hamid, and trying to work through what was relevant and not. Um, he actually selected five different uh, data sources. On top of this, um, one of the data sources that we previously had been using, Sustain Analytics, we'd been uh, basically consuming their data in quite a straightforward format. It was pretty much just a table, the data we would take, and uh, you know, we'd just uh, glue it next to the portfolios. It would give us a good idea and understanding and it helped everyone understand what was going on. Um, but what happened is because of this explosion, as I spoke about, about data points uh, being available, plus uh, Hamid bringing in the, uh, the five different sources available, um, he also explained how there's going to be roughly about 60,000 new securities, plus 300 countries to cover, um, and in total, there's about 5,500 fields. So you can imagine when he first explained this to me, uh, I was a bit concerned, um, slightly worried, uh, having had obviously experienced uh, many different parts of market EDM and the way that we structure the data, um, I was thinking if we were to manage this in the same way that we currently manage our master security or any mastering data, it was going to be a long, long haul to, uh, to get there. It could potentially take us maybe two, three years to actually consume it all properly, understand the field, understand this sort of formatting, understand where it should lie, uh, where its relevances are and, and so forth. So there was a lot of concern about how we were actually going to go about this. Um, there was also the, uh, the case that uh, Sustain Analytics, which is the, the main provider really of a lot of the data and actually make up 4,500 fields, they actually were changing their format because of the sheer quantity of data that they were going to be providing. They went from actually a simple table to suddenly a narrow table, but providing nine different tables. So there'd be one table was pure market security, and the others were just uh, data points. So it was a case that us as the uh, consumer of the data needed to re-pivot and understand what was going on and try and select what was required. So obviously being confronted with all these changes and trying to understand how we can fit this together and, and work as a team and also help the uh, third pillar, as I mentioned earlier, the ESG integration about bringing the, uh, the data uh, in front of the portfolio managers and also for, for the ESG team and also risk and compliance and various other users of the data. So we had to think about how we brought that all together. Um, so we, we were discussing, uh, obviously internally, different concepts and ideas, uh, but as we have also the uh, market EDM in place, we, uh, we actually approached uh, market and discussed the, uh, the, the constraints and problems that we were going to face. Uh, upon brainstorming it, 
as we have a bit of an agile and collaborative approach to these uh, these types of projects, uh, we worked through how we could potentially set it up. And so th this is actually where our market did come back and, and help us a lot because they explained to us how they would actually help build the import of the sustain analytics files. So we actually uh, pulling the first of all, the, uh, the data security part, and then we pull in all of the, uh, the fields. And then upon all, all of that arriving, to control the fact that there are 4,500 fields, and we don't necessarily at this stage want all of them, there's a reference table. So actually, uh, what was then built as well is the reference table for all of the sustain analytics fields. And it meant that the, uh, the end user on the web portal can actually select the fields that they are interested in, and then it will populate the fields that they require. So this, again, is the uh, sort of uh, one of the, the, the big parts of the, the case study that was built. And it helped us actually understand the, the data. And we worked closely with the ESG team to, to present that and populate that for them. So they've actually got the, uh, the, the hand on, on pulling that data in and actually pulling in the fields that they require. So the, the challenges that we were facing, as, as obviously you can tell from the, what I've just said, is that there was the huge amount of uh, data that we were collecting and then actually uh, understanding the way that the data should be formatted and then the, which fields were actually required by the teams and then eventually how to actually consume it in a user-friendly way. Because if, as you can imagine, if the, uh, the, the ESG team were just using the, uh, the narrow tables, they were going to be doing lots of pivoting inside of uh, an Excel or maybe a Power BI and doing various other uh, reformatting. So this, again, is actually where Market EDM were able to, to come in and re-pivot our data to make it usable and uh, in a nice uh, format, which meant that suddenly we had the security and then we had all the fields that we actually required, not the 4,500, and then we had all of the data points that, that we required. And that was uh, a huge uh, success for us because actually had we built it ourselves, that would have easily taken us a couple of years to do. If we'd gone through every single uh, field and security and made sure that it was all tallying up, uh, this is a huge undertaking. So that's the way that it's, it's been done. What was also part of the project I didn't mention is that the fact that the data comes in doesn't mean that we want to then stick it straight into our masters or start to store all of the data. Because again, what's going on with the ESG is that there are so many data fields. There's so much, uh, so many uh, fields available that it can explode a database. So you have to be careful that uh, you don't want to just suddenly go from just having about 200 gigabytes to suddenly having a tegabyte straight away. So you need to need to think about it logically and also make it a sustainable solution. So at the moment, the data does come in. It does allow the uh, the ESG team to, to review it, to, to play with it and so on. And as we start to build more awareness and understanding of all of these fields, we will then start to build out a pure uh, ESG type master security area. Um, but we're not pop, uh, we're not polluting the rest of the data, and we're able to actually transform the the files in a way that's usable and manageable by the teams. That's a really really detailed answer, and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna point out a couple things that I thought think are interesting that you mentioned um, that I've heard in a couple different different areas, and and one is is the size of the data set and the universe can seem insurmountable as you, as you start to look at this, especially with different providers. And I think that, you know, for participants who are just entering this, I think David keyed on something that I've heard from SASB, we've heard from GRC, is materiality. That, you know, you have to look at your investment process and you have to look at the data points that are going to impact that. So it seems to me that you what you did was you looked at the universe and you gave portfolio managers the ability to determine what's material, and you gave them controls to change that process, incorporate new points of materiality as part of this base solution. Correct. Yes. So ultimately, it's about uh, empowering the users. So by allowing the ESG team to decide which of the fields which are relevant for them at that moment in time, it means that they can actually select uh, what they require and they can then actually use that, whether it may be in an internal report or uh, an analysis that they're doing with one of the analysts or the portfolio managers and understand what, what actually is going on. They also um, are able to share that information with uh, the different teams as well, because at the moment, um, obviously it's heavily, obviously the ESG team is, is, is working through it and, and bring it to, to fruition. 
but the uh, the other teams also involved are the risk and performance team because a lot of the ESG data is all associated to the fundamental uh, of investments and actually has a lot of uh, lot of saying in the risk area. So these two uh, two areas are heavily related and there's a lot of crossover. So there's a lot of information being passed across there. There's also the compliance level as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the uh, the pillars that we do we've always covered uh, very strongly is the exclusions, um, and that's always been there. And actually, we do use the, the data points from market as well to, to to cover that and to make sure that's in place. Um, but yes, so it's, it's very much about making sure that actually everyone has access to these uh, the different data and actually being able to use it in a uh, in a user friendly manner. Okay. Now you know obviously. You, you touched on one other point. I, I wanted to, to ask a quick question on this and get your perspective on this. You've got a few different providers you mentioned. Sustain is obviously a, a big component of your ESG G data set, but I'm, I'm assuming we've you've probably got Bloomberg data. You may have IHS market data. You may have refinitive data. Were there any challenges in terms of consolidating that universe of data from the asset to the analytics when providers you know use different references or d- different lookups? And were there were there any things that you felt that you were had in your your toolkit that allowed you to address that? And, and you know, without giving anything away proprietary and how your team manages things, you know, what is there guidance for making the the introduction of a new data source or a new data set a little bit easier? Yeah, so it's it's a, it's a tricky one, but as you uh, quite rightly point out, in a in a utopia, in an ideal world. Um, it would be the case that all the providers would provide us with the same security identification, with the same date format, with the same values inside, and we would just merge it all together and it would be ideal. Um, but we don't live in a utopia yet, and I suppose they're all building their own uh, sort of concepts, so we have to uh, almost accept the, the way they are at the moment. I think that maybe uh, further down the line in the future, there may be uh, maybe people try to, to come together what I would say is, it's one of the uh, one of the key identifiers which does seem to to run across a lot of the different uh, sources that we do receive is obviously the the ISIN. Um, there is the uh, the issue that sometimes the ISIN isn't unique enough, uh, so then we do then start looking at other codes. Uh, Bloomberg do have a, uh, a fundamental level idea as well, and uh, that's actually uh, quite popular. Um, but again, to be honest, it, it all depends on the different uh, securities that you're looking at. Uh, we also have one provider called uh, Beyond Rating, which is a country specific one. So again, it's a slightly different concept as, as to what you're looking at and, and how you actually pair that again back to, to if you are looking at the portfolio or the benchmark. And um, so we've done various lookups on, the, for example, country of risk or country of domicile. And so again, it comes down to the way that the, uh, the portfolio manager or the investment team decide they want to see it or the, uh, the ESG team wish to, to, to classify it. So there are quite a few uh, uh, parts that we do need to probably still uh, do more work on, uh, but you do uh, bring up a very valid point that uh, to do the matching and actually making sure that all the securities are aligned. Um, there is probably more work to be done on that side, uh, but at the moment we're able to, to bring it enough to, to, together to be able to have a good overview of the portfolio and the securities that we currently hold and the securities in our benchmark, uh, which are the, uh, the fundamental parts. The, uh, the other parts that we start to think about is obviously um, how to help the, uh, the, the portfolio managers and the analysts think about new securities and actually the vast amount of data, as I mentioned at the beginning, the fact that with all of these different files, we can get to roughly about 60,000 securities. Um, and at the moment, we obviously uh, just under 7 billion Swiss francs. So clearly we don't invest in all of these things. So we need to sort of uh, tally that all up. But it's a... Uh, it's an important point that it's just the sheer size of the, the data that, that we're looking at. Okay, terrific, terrific. Um, that was really, again, super, very helpful. And I think it, it's transparent there. Now, obviously, we've been talking uh, prior to this because you've done a case study on the work you've done with EDM. Um, you talked a little bit about the need for matching. And I know that's a big part of your infrastructure within the market EDM platform. As you started to look at this and, and you had prior experience, how much of, uh, of that kind of prior experience in, uh, led you to EDM? And, you know, how do you feel that EDM kind of accelerated that, that delivery for your ESG in terms of, of the overall? I think you've given some of us uh, some, of, some of that background already, but if there's anything key in terms of, you know, how you drove to the decision to use our platform and to partner with us. 
Yeah, so there, there's many things that, that go through in the analysis and trying to work out where you should be storing the data, how it should be looked after, um, is this the best place or not? And uh, there were some concerns as uh, one of the, the challenges actually was how do we deal with all of this data that we may not need next week? And I suppose that was answered a bit with the reference tables and, and how that all works. So that, but before we could get there, we all were obviously uh, doing some brainstorming and we were thinking about different, different ideas. The obviously the classic way is to say, okay, well, let's first we'll start off in Excel. So you dump everything in Excel and then very quickly you realize Excel keeps falling over and it's not going to last. So then there's, uh, I suppose, some IT minds that go, oh, let's grab an access database and throw it all in there and then we can rejig it and so on. But the fact that we already had market EDM in place, we had a data management tool which is prepared and ready to actually receive these files, consume them, and populate them, and actually the, the people had access to, to the system. It made more sense for us to actually spend the time to build it inside of market EDM and make sure that it was as, as light as it can be for the moment, whilst we start to understand uh, all of the different uh, elements that are going to come forward. Uh, for example, out of the uh, 5,000 fields and so on, like there's lots of fields, to be honest, to do with like nuclear power plants, to do with uh, water as well, and, and various other climate parts, which at the moment, they, we've got the, the data, so we could use them if we require them, but at the moment, it's not our, our top priority. So um, we've got the ability now to, to come back and add that in or take that away as we require it. So I think it's, it's, it's very much, uh, you know, we were analyzing the different options available, and for us, it made a sensible fit to, to put this with market EDM and following the conversations that obviously we had when we explained the, the project and, and what we were looking to do. Uh, the teams obviously came together and, and they've helped build the, the, the different parts of the uploads and the, uh, the ability to transform it, pivot it and, and so forth. So I think for us, it was uh, it's a bit of a no brainer, really, to, to go down that path. Um, clearly, I'm sure other asset management houses, they may have built their own internal databases or they may have done other, other ways of doing this. I'm not saying this is the only way, but definitely the way that for for Mirabeau Asset Management and with the uh, the resources that we had available and set up, it made a lot of sense. Well, I'm going to definitely take the term no-brainer out to the market in terms of <laughs> EDM and ESG. Um, I, think, I think a lot of people will want to hear that, at least from my organization. Um, but I do appreciate that the fact that that's there. And I always do say that, you know, one thing that IHS believes is, is that we've got technology and when we have the right partnerships with clients, we come up with the great end state solutions. And um, it's glad to see that that's really the case in, in this particular example. Um, you know, with the eye to time, I, I, you know, I think we've got a couple more minutes left. There's a couple things that I'd be curious about in terms of helping organizations who are new to this. So obviously you have an ESG team in place. It's been part of your philosophy, but you talked a little bit about it going out into performance and risk. Um, how does that ESG team now, uh, as a core data management function, what's its interaction with other parts of the organizations? Are, are there challenges or the requests for clarifications? You know, how do you govern that process? Because as you introduce a new data set, you're introducing a new area of expertise and you, people will, will want to have some support in that transition. Yeah, no, definitely. The, I would say that there's no uh, golden uh, sort of bullet to, to make all this work. And obviously, uh, it's very much up to the, uh, the, the individuals and the teams themselves to, to come together and actually get behind the, uh, the new data sets, the new information available. And it's very much uh, for us, the, the fact that the ESG team have been uh, asking for help and support on the, uh, the data side, the fact that we actually built this out for them um, has actually started to, to then allow them to speak to the other teams with more coherency. Because before it was very much, they were grabbing the, the classic information. Uh, as I mentioned, actually back in uh, 2019, we were receiving some ESG data which it wasn't too much. So it was a couple of scores and they were able to easily see it. Even the portfolio manager could easily see a score next to their portfolio. It was no, it was not very complicated and complex. Um, and then the explosion obviously, of data that we have actually taken on board uh, has meant that actually uh, you need people to actually have a bit more ownership and understanding. Uh, clearly, there's no point in uh, us producing a huge table and loads of reports with loads of numbers, which make no sense. So it has to be managed in, in the correct manner. So the ESG team obviously have taken uh, the first steps and the, the, the big lead on, on that. 
and they are educating them the uh, the risk and the reporting teams on the the different concepts along with compliance to make sure that at the same time there's there's an understanding um, but the key people as well are the analysts and the portfolio managers so there's there's really a, a whole group so the the ESG team does actually have an overarching uh, part our head of investment is is very keen on the uh, the ESG uh, different elements and is pushing that as well for a lot of the uh, investment processes that we have in place to adopt additional uh, procedures and, and policies. And as we start to build out that area, we will probably build out the fact that the labeling on some of the, the funds will become ESG funds and so forth. Okay. Uh, last thing, you know, just, just touching on that, that concept of, you know, that concept of that, that, that array of reports, you know, as you start to see this consolidation of ESG, are you starting to see it peak its way into RFPs, sales artifacts? Obviously, you mentioned that there was numbers on the funds, but what we've seen is a trend towards more in-depth questions about the underlying investments rather than just that greenwashing, like you said. Is this becoming a, a big part of your RFP and your sales process in terms of, of, of these data points? So um, obviously, I'd need to speak with the uh, marketing sales guys to, to find out more from, from their, their point of view. But they do have access actually inside the web UI of market EVM. So we do actually consolidate most of our data inside uh, there. So they can actually find the funds. They can find the information on it. They can find additional, uh, whether it be dividend yields and so forth. They can also uh, locate then the uh, different scores that are available for the different sources. They can also see the, the different levels there as well. So ultimately, the uh, the data is available to them. Uh, I and there is a small team of marketing uh, guys who do focus on the RFPs. And uh, there is becoming more and more uh, sort of requests to actually be able to perform a automated filling of RFPs and so on. And that's definitely uh, future projects that I can imagine that I may be dragged into, as I am the jack of all trades, as I said. Um, but yes, so it's definitely something that is building and that is uh, definitely becoming more popular, um, especially with more and more platforms around. Um, I'd imagine yourselves with uh, with Market, you probably are getting approached by more people to, to help populate various, uh, whether it be databases like Cambridge and so forth, and and to to actually pass the data over to them. Yeah, we're seeing a growing trend in, and within my, my platform, particularly the warehouse component, the reporting store, we, we're starting to look at e-vestment in Cambridge. We, we've also got a number of clients who have a use case where, you know, one of the things is RFP for fulfillment and ongoing requests. So I think you're aligned to that trend. And it's great to see that, you know, it's more than just the managing of the data. That self-service component was a big part of the delivery that you were able to give to your users via EDM. Um, with that in mind and looking to time and just trying to keep this to the half hour we've agreed to, is there anything you want to highlight that's next in terms of either ESG or data management in general? Because as you said, you're kind of one of those key project resources. What's the next project that you think is on your horizon, whether it's more work in ESG or, or something new, perhaps? Yeah, so um, I suppose in terms of the ESG project, it's it's far from finished. Um, there's a lot more to, to, to come from that area. So at the moment, obviously, we've been focusing, as I mentioned, the case study about how we, we pulled in the source and the data and so on. And now it's the case of the, uh, the ESG team really thinking about uh, the different uh, data points that they've got. Uh, they're looking at different uh, potential sort of formulas of how they actually uh, want to see the market or how they want to analyze this, this information. So there's a lot of work going on uh, there at the moment. Um, and ultimately, we would want to arrive at the point where we've got our own uh, pure internal Mirabeau style ESG uh, uh, formulas and, and setup. Um, but obviously, before we get there, we need to sort of fully understand all these di different elements. So there's a lot of work that's going on there, and uh, that's that's progressing. Um, then there's the uh, the element of actually providing more information uh, in a more succinct manner. Uh, as you can imagine, that the, uh, the portfolio managers and analysts today, uh, their desktop space is uh, their retail space, space on the desktop is crucial. So they can't have everything, and they can't read everything straight away, and so on. So we need to think about ways of actually whether it's uh, new graphics or new, new information about how to provide it to them in, in a, in a user-friendly manner. So there's a lot of uh, projects thinking about how we actually go about doing things like this. Uh, it might be the case that we plug in more Power BI solutions into Market EVM to, to read it and create more visualized, uh, for example, tree charts and so forth. 
as we are thinking about different concepts there. Um, but ultimately, yeah, there's there, there's a whole demand actually on the ESG side to to keep on uh, moving forward uh, with the developments that have uh, taken place. Uh, we're also looking to uh, populate a lot of the uh, ESG data down to our order management system. So ultimately, the, the portfolio manager can see all of the, the new numbers um, straight away on their screens. So these are the, uh, the sort of future projects in the, in the near term. Uh, we've also got a huge project underway at the moment where we are changing. Uh, we're using a, a new uh, risk and performance uh, engine. So with this new engine in place, and again, that's going to be consuming uh, some of the ESG data and bringing that all together in, in a new way, a new manner, so that, again, the investment teams can actually understand what they're, they're looking at and how they could use the, the information. Yeah, Quite so a big quite... book then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so at the moment, I mean, everyone thought maybe COVID would be a quiet time, but it seems to just get busier and busier. I, I always say that the reward for good work is more work. <laughs> <laughs> So it seems that people, uh, that you're a proof point of that. Listen, David, you know, I want to thank you again for your time on this session. I want to thank you for your time on the case study. And I would welcome all the participants and everyone listening in to, to, to look at that case study. I want to thank WBR for their time and giving us the opportunity to kind of talk about, again, how IHS market partners with clients for success. And again, David, with Mirabal, we always look for that next opportunity to work together. So thank you again and have a great day. Thank you.